Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on working with local organic grains. This is your host, Alice Formica, from the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org at the link on your screen. This webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording on our website and on the eOrganic YouTube channel in about a week. I've uploaded a handout of the slides of the webinar, and you can find that in the handout section of your control panel. Before we start, I'd like to give you a very quick rundown of today's program. The presentation will last about 45 minutes. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, at which time we'll have about 30 minutes for your questions. So today, instead of our usual presenters, who are often researchers, farmers, and extension educators, we're very excited to be hosting a group of bakers and pasta makers who will be discussing how they use local and organic grains. So we're very pleased to introduce Stefan Zenders of Wide Awake Bakery in Trumansburg, New York, Peter Endres of Runner and Stone Bakery and Restaurant in Brooklyn, New York, Dan Avery of Dakota Earth Bakery and Pasta Shop in Alcester, South Dakota, and Steve Gonzalez of Svolini Pasta Shop, also in Brooklyn, New York. This webinar was organized by Elizabeth Dick of Ogrin as part of a NIFA OREI research project called Value Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems. Several other webinars on ancient grains and heritage wheat varieties that this group has done over the past few years are available in our archive. So Elizabeth is going to come on and briefly introduce the webinar and then I'll hand things over to Stefan Zenders. Yes, thanks, Alice. So as you mentioned, the Value Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems Project has been working for the past four years. And our goal has been to uh, help reintegrate food grade small grain production and processing into the Northeast with an emphasis on modern heritage wheat and the so-called ancient grains spelled emmer and einkorn. But from the beginning of the project, we've worked with not only farmers, millers, and other grain processors, but also bakers, chefs, and consumers, knowing that to be successful, um, those involved along the entire value-added grains food chain must be consulted and involved. So today, we're going to be hearing from bakers and chefs who are at the forefront of experimenting with and utilizing locally and regionally grown grains in their enterprises, not just in the Northeast, but also across the country. So with no further ado, let's hear from the presenters. <clears throat> Hello there. I don't know if you all can hear me. This is Stefan Senders. Um, so I run the Wide Awake Bakery. Um, we're a small bakery in upstate New York. I think what's uh, of interest uh, to you, I'm hoping, uh, with respect to our bakery, is that we are a partnership of um, farmer, miller, and baker. So we um, we bake breads like like that one you see right there. Um, we have a we're a partnership between Oshner Farms, which is about five miles away. I, I am not going to read these powerpoints. I'm just going to talk about what we do, and you can read them as you go. Um, Oshner Farms is uh, about five miles away, and the mill is about two miles away. So we have a very tight little chain. Um, the farm is about 650 acres plus or minus. It varies a little bit. Um, and this is a great advantage to us, um, primarily because we're physically so close. Everything is very fresh and very easy to it's very easy for us to see what we're doing, what we're dealing with, and to talk with each other. We're very close socially, uh, and so on. So that that helps a lot. Um, Tor over at Oshner Farms grows a lot of different grains, um, all organic, um, wheat, corn, rye, and so on. We mostly use this is the that's a picture of the um, the mill and farm team. Um, we primarily use uh, wheat, uh, rye spelt, polenta, cornmeal, sometimes emmer. Uh, Tor, I think, has not grown emmer in the past couple of years, so we haven't had, haven't had access to that. Um, I think what's most important about our bakery is um, it's a, a handwork-based bakery, so we don't use a lot of machines. Um, you know, we have mixers, but we're doing very, very short mixes, um, so almost everything is done, done by hand. And, in some circumstances, if we were a commodity bakery, um, that would put us at a great disadvantage. But we're not really, so we have the opportunity to work very closely with the flour. 
uh, and that is very much to our advantage. That is to feel it, to feel it every day and every batch that comes out of the mill, we can feel it, we can smell it, we can just rub it in your fingers and your fingers are very, very sensitive uh, and you can feel uh, how granular it is and um, as soon as it's wet, uh, you can check it against a, a kind of a tactile library uh, that you gain as a as a hand baker, and this is very very helpful in a way that flour testing uh, will will you know it's it's a degree of sensitivity that I don't think flour testing will ever reach. We make pastries, we make granola, we make pasta, we make a lot of different breads. Um, we're always experimenting with new things. We built a pizza oven, so we're getting into pizza. We we just are very interested in experimenting. Um, let's see. I think what you would also find interesting about our bakery is that um, from a marketing perspective, um, we run a bread share. That is, it's like a CSA, so people sign up uh, in and pay in advance for loaves. and we sell in addition wholesale and retail and we do farmers markets and so on but that bread share is terrific for us um, you know if you think about being a baker uh, baking for markets primarily you're really at risk every day you put a tremendous amount of labor on the line and a smaller amount but significant amount of materials on the line and if it rains that's gone basically you don't make very much at all um, in our case our loaves are paid for before we bake them you know even when that's uh, half of the of the total bake that is a huge security to us uh, to have half of that bake paid for it really makes it makes things a lot easier and a lot uh, emotionally a lot more comfortable so that's an interesting thing it's all online managed um, so we don't spend a lot of time uh, dealing with accounts and so on Fol folks are able to pay online they can turn their their bread shares on and off and adjust them online so that's a great um, great thing for us um, Let's see. I wanted to address a couple of concerns. One is a lot of folks have had some difficulty, or at least let me put it this way. They have talked about difficulty using the flour and um, using, you know, we use farmer ground flour, but any uh, stone ground, uh, largely whole grain or bolted flour, uh, folks have trouble uh, with it being what, what feels like being unpredictable. And this, I think, is especially true for home bakers, even though the risk is much greater for a professional baker. Just think about this for a second. Um, if What I would say to you is uh, the degree of variability is primarily with the baker. Now, if you think about that, if you're a home baker, you're doing a batch, maybe a couple of pounds of flour, so call it a kilo, and you are hydrating that batch at, say, 70%. Now, that's neither wet nor dry. It's kind of in a nice, easy range. It's going to give you a nice crumb, and it's easy to work. All it takes is 50 milliliters of water, and this is a very, very small amount of water indeed, to get you up to 75% hydration, which is a much more challenging hydration. A few more drops, and you're up there in the in the high 70s. And what you, what I'm trying to make the point that I'm making is that very small variations in uh, the baker's practice uh, result in quite large variations in the uh, in the quality and workability of the dough and bread. So um, what I would say is if you want to start working with these flours, the most important thing you can do to have success is be precise uh, as you go. Take great care with, with variables such as hydration uh, and your salt, your salt quantity. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see, pricing. Um, it is more expensive, of course, to buy this flour. Um, my opinion as a bakery owner is that uh, it's, if, if you are, I, I say this based only on my own experience, but that if you are running such a tight margin that that difference in flour cost is going to put you into the red, you are running too tight. Um, it, it, in my opinion, your your money should be going into labor, and you should you should be selling at a higher price if you uh, and, and and that would that would give you a little bit more breathing room to use a higher qu uh, quality flour, or at least to use a local organic flour. Um, customer reaction: our experience is extraordinarily good. Uh, folks love what we do. Uh, this is our the picture of our, our bread distribution through our bread CSA. Um, 
we work very closely with the community, so we're engaged with the anti-fracking movement here. People are, our people are very interested in being engaged with us, and they see us as very closely engaged with the community. So that's basically like a, that has, that's not the flower itself, that's the way we are as bakers, but that's important. Um, again, just <laughs> from a baker's perspective, uh, the local grains are very active fermenters, and it means that if you want to be a good baker uh, with this kind of stuff, you need to be very precise in your fermentation and uh, in your measurements at, at every level. Some folks think it's scary. I don't think so. Uh, our bakers who are trained here, they honestly, when I tell them people are concerned about using local local flowers, they just shrug their shoulders and say, what are you talking about? That's just what we do every day. It's, it's nothing. Um, you want to know scary? That is scary. Um, Basically, there are very simple rules. If you want to work with local flour, just be precise. And if you, you know, sure we can print this off for you, but this is basically telling you, focus. Be very, very precise at what you do. You know, scale correctly and uh, and carefully. Be very careful with your salt. Uh, don't immediately leap to high hydration. Practice your fermentation. Um, I could go into some detail about that, but. Um, for example, you know, we find differences. We pre-ferment a portion of our flour. The difference between pre-fermenting 10% of the flour and pre-fermenting 12% of the flour, and you may say that's not that much, that is enough to make a bread that looks beautiful or doesn't look beautiful, that tastes beautiful or doesn't taste quite so beautiful. So these are very, very small differences, uh, and so I encourage you to attend to them. What else can I tell you? I think that's about it. I would just tell you that baking is a long and beautiful road, and it's not something you master. You just keep after it, and, um, and you do the best you can. If you have any questions, just fire them away, and I'll be very happy to answer them. Thanks. So I'm going to hand this back. Okay. So now we're going to hear from um, Peter Endres of Runner and Stone. Hi, all. Um, so I guess I'll start with uh, just a little overview of, of our operation. Uh, in many ways, I feel I found myself nodding along with Stefan. I think we have a similar attitude towards bread and, and probably a similar scale, uh, similar scale production, um, as well as a hands-on approach to the bakery. With, I know that he's in the bakery all the time, and, and so am I. Um, we started uh, actually selling in markets. We were working out of a commercial kitchen and we were selling at a few outdoor markets on the weekends while our uh, actual brick and mortar space was under construction and that was useful to us to just um, get the word out and practice our recipes. Um, we always started with using all um, local whole grains, the only non-local breads, we, uh, flours we use are our white flour and uh, our Dorum flour which we use in one of our loaves. Um, everything else, all our rye spelt, uh, white spelt, um, whole wheat and buckwheat flours, uh, as well as the all-purpose flour all come from uh, local mills from farmer ground flour, most of it, uh, and then the white spelt comes from Champlain Valley Milling. Um, our operation is a bakery and restaurant, so we have we open at 7.30 every day. We have a full bread line, full pastry line uh, via Mossery. And then at we do lunch from 11 to 3, and then at 5 o'clock uh, we take the pastries off the counter and it becomes a wine bar, and then we have a full restaurant with uh, full liquor, beer, wine. So it's, it's kind of two operations in one, and um, the reason for that was I always wanted to do a retail bakery and not have a wholesale bakery. Uh, I had been in wholesale production. I'd worked at wholesale production bakeries, and I didn't really enjoy the work, and I found that the... Um, I guess the, the lack of customer contact made the job a little less fulfilling for me. Um, and so to keep it retail and still be able to pay the rent, we decided to pair it with um, with a restaurant. Uh, and so my business partner and the other owner of Runner and Stone is a chef, and he runs the kitchen, I run the bakery. Uh, and both operations kind of feed off one another. Uh, it, I feel like more and more you're seeing this model in New York and elsewhere, kind of like the uh, Le Pan Cotidien model, and um, and it works for us because we have restaurant customers who find out a year in that we have a bakery and then become morning coffee customers and vice versa, and so that's been nice. Um, the 
uh, picture of Chris and I there at our bar. Um, just to go through our product line, um, we do a bunch of different breads. I think our most popular bread, unfortunately, is our white baguette. <laughs> um, I feel like the whole grain breads always lag behind the white breads in sales, but uh, but we work to to try and fix that. And I feel like we've been able to get some people hooked on some of our whole grain breads. Um, we make a rye ciabatta, which has about 30% rye flour in it, and that's a very popular bread. Um, as well as our Balsano rye, which is a, a lighter sourdough rye with rye flour and spelt flour, totaling almost 30%. Um, and those are popular items, which is nice. Uh, the pretzels, which is pictured there, pretzels are made with 100% local organic white spelt flour from Champlain Valley Milling. And those, of course, are popular at our market. We'll sell you know, 150 or 200 of them. Um, we managed to squeeze a little bit of whole grain flour into our Viennoiserie as well. All our uh, Quasanto has 10% farmer ground flour, whole wheat flour, uh, as does our brioche dough. And, um, and that also, I think, has been helpful just to display some of the white flour in our production uh, and get some more of the local whole grains in it. Uh, that's a picture of our market stand. We still currently do a market on Sundays, and that's been a really good part of our business and I think helps uh, helps our customer base understand what they're purchasing, uh, which I'll get to a little later why I feel that that's important. Um, just because I think at the farmer's market, people somehow feel a little more empowered to ask about ingredients, whereas in a shop uh, or a restaurant setting, they maybe feel less, feel less likely to uh, feel that as they're ripe somehow, like they're just there as guests, whereas a market seems a little more interactive, like we're in it together. And so a lot of people will ask more about that or will talk about the percentage of different flowers in the breads more. The shop is a little more transactional, people getting their morning coffee and they're on their way to somewhere. Uh, the market, people seem to have more time. And so I feel like just from a value-added standpoint, I feel like I'm, the market, farmer's market scene is a little more conducive to asking people to pay a little more money for more expensive um, products as a result of more expensive flour. Um, the farmer ground all-purpose flour pretty much is our pastry flour. We use that in almost all of our, our sweets. Um, I do all the desserts, the plated desserts for the restaurant too, and that also uses all... Uh, of the local flowers, that's another way to kind of incorporate them into our production. I feel like on the sweets end, there's maybe a little, it's a little less difficult to incorporate them into recipes, these pastry recipes without having the added component of uh, a living yeast seem to be more predictable in general, and so you can kind of adjust the recipe the first time you make it with your, with your uh, local stone, grown, stone ground flour. And then the recipe is good to go, whereas bread will still potentially be a little more um, variable. We do um, all our own pastas for the restaurant, and many of those are whole grain. Um, we have a pasta extruder, and so we use the uh, we use a lot of the whole grain flours to make extruded pastas, which we sell at markets as well. And they're also a big part of our restaurant menu. We have a whole pasta section, so there's at any given time four or five pastas, not including any specials we're running, and that's another way to incorporate the uh, local grains into our production. Um, this is a quick overview of some of the percentages uh, of local grains in our products. Um, again, some of the pastries are 100% because it's an all-purpose flour and there's a little less of a structure issue in a, a financier, for example, versus a, a baguette. So we're able to incorporate more. We make a granola too, and that uses the raw dose from main grains, um, which we order through Green Market as well. Um, some of the, just in talking now about our customer reaction, um, <clears throat> I think we, we spend a lot of time, uh, I do and the other owner, Chris, spent a lot of time sourcing locally and trying to cook and bake seasonally. And I think that, I would have to, if I'm just going to throw a percentage out there, I would say 20 to 30 percent of the people care about that. <laughs> I think the rest of the customers, especially for the, again, the restaurant and the shop retail customers here uh, in our area are a lot more concerned with consistency and, uh, and 
just general quality of the product than they would be with um, than they would be with where we're sourcing our grains from. Uh, again, we have more conversations about that at the farmers market, and I do feel that at the farmers market, the few times people have brought up price as a barrier to purchasing, and we explain to them, you know, our product is made mostly organic ingredients, uh, all the flowers are local, and that there's a cost for that. Um, they they kind of understand. I think they're more likely to purchase the product, and I've had the experience of convincing, quote unquote, people to purchase things, and then I see them week in and week out. Um, which is a kind of nice affirmation of what we're doing and that people can taste the quality. Um, I do, just to speak to what Stefan was mentioning about um, the production, uh, the variability as a result of the whole grain flowers, I agree with him that I think there's so many other variables that are a bigger obstacle or present a bigger challenge to the baker um, that the variability in whole grain flowers is kind of is minimal. I think that is in large part due to the scale of both of our bakeries. I don't, I, I'm not exactly sure of the scale of, of Wide Awake Bakery, but I know that we don't, our biggest mixes, our mixer only holds 50 kilos of dough at a time. So the biggest mix we're going to be doing is 50 kilos of dough, which I know is a, a fraction of what some of the larger, uh, at least New York City bakeries, if not wholesale bakeries around the country in general are doing. And I think because also we, as Wide Awake, have an extremely uh, manual process, we, the only machine we use is the mixer and the oven. Um, we divide everything by hand, we shape everything by hand, and we have a small staff, so we're all in constant communication about how this pre-ferment felt or how that dough felt, that I think that that helps ameliorate any problems that might come up. Uh, it's also easier to control the fermentation of 10 kilos of dough than it would be to control the fermentation of 200 kilos of dough um, just because the mass of it. And so I think that the scale of the scale of our production um, makes it a lot easier to deal with any small variations in the flour, of which I have to say I don't find a lot, uh, especially anymore. Maybe four years ago, farmer ground flour was a little more variable. I feel like the millers there um, with whom I've had countless conversations and probably thanks in large part to Stefan's relationship with them, I feel like they pretty much get it um, and they understand how to achieve the consistency uh, in grind that they're looking for or that I should say we are looking for as bakers. So I don't find that to be a big variable. Um, I think one, one thing um, that Oh, there's a picture of some of our bakers who went up to visit Farm Ground Flour and, and Wide Awake Bakery over the summer, and that was really nice. Um, the final issue to, to discuss would be, I think, for us, the cost of local grains is probably the biggest impediment to using them. Um, it's still something we're willing to do, uh, even though I'm, our bakery is certainly not making money. <laughs> um, but I think that the... Uh, one thing that Stefan had mentioned is like if your um, margins are so small that, that that would make a difference, then there's other things to consider. And I do agree with that. I think that there are many other ways to cut costs um, and to kind of quote unquote blame it all on the ingredients would be a, a, poor, a poor excuse. Uh, that said, however, just considering our own costs, I know um, local ingredients in general are going to cost more, and then if you add to that organic, it certainly jacks up the price even more. And just for example, I mean, our uh, last year we spent about sixty thousand dollars in flour. Um, so if you consider that maybe a third of that or a quarter of that is local grains, and you consider that the local the local flour is on average twice as expensive per pound as a conventional non-local uh, would be. It winds up being tens of thousands of dollars uh, over the course of the year, and that's for a small-scale bakery. So I do think that the cost is is certainly a consideration, um, and I think that passing it on to the com consumer um, can be difficult because I know people don't. I don't think people here. Uh, want to spend more than a certain amount of money for bread. So I think already for our uh, whole wheat baguette, which uses 
of local organic flour. We're charging $4 for a 400 gram baguette. And some people visibly react to it. And I think that um, a lot of people just will walk by or we're not on their list because that is probably twice what they could pay for a really bad baguette granted in a supermarket. But it's still, I feel like a lot of people still think of bread as one of those like a commodity, so it, it kind of goes by the supermarket price and they judge uh, what can I do with this one baguette versus what can I do with this whole loaf of bread that I can buy from the supermarket. Um, and I think we have to deal with that as small bakeries. We have to kind of find the happy medium between losing some customers and charging what we feel is appropriate for the quality of ingredient um, that we're using. Uh, so I had I had mentioned that a price subsidy I think on local flowers or some type of tax credit for the good that using uh, that using local ingredients I think uh, presents is could be a, an interesting local government issue or a state government issue um, to encourage this the regional grain economy here. So uh, that is it for me. I will uh, pass it over. Thank you. Okay, Dan here. For uh, for two years, we worked out of our living room in the lower left here, and we got to a point where we said, it's either quit this monkey business or move on and, and, and get a bigger building. So we did. In our third year, in the upper right here, you see a picture in front of our, our new building, new. We've been in it for a couple of years now. Everything that we do comes out of this front door. Probably 1% of our, of our products are actually sold in our building. The rest go to farmer's market. And it's been a wonderful opportunity, as I hear Peter talk about especially, to get that feedback from the customer. Because without that feedback, we're new at this. This is only our third year as a bakery and our fifth year as, as making pasta. We have to have feedback because we frankly don't have all the answers. And I appreciate hearing Stefan's discussion because he has some answers that he even presented today for us. Now Alcester is really small. We've got to drive about 45 miles to the to the nearest farmers market. We do another one in the other direction about that far. But this is just a, an example of how small Alcester is in the lower right there. You see a picture of what happened last Saturday. If you look really close right in the center of the street you can see people gathered together. That's our local hay sale. So everything happens out. And that kind of sets the theme of what we're dealing with. We're dealing in a, a, an area where we're the breadbasket, but yet we have to think things new because we're retraining our people to think niche market, niche market. We do a lot of variety of things, but um, we've taken the approach that we add a main component. Our first component was pasta. And frankly, our, our pasta levels have dropped a lot. And there's a long story to that. And part of it's our own doing. But part of it was supply issues, believe it or not, supply issues when we're in the breadbasket area. Um, I'm kind of envious of, of uh, you guys being able to get local grains because we can't get local grains in what should be the local grain market. But we've added components. We started out with the pasta. And we, as we went along, we realized that we had to pull in a whole bakery also in order to make this thing work. And again, we're young at this. We're new, but I wanted to be an encouragement for those that are out there saying, maybe I need to go to the next level and, and go commercial. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, last year, we did about 23,000 loaves of bread, about 29,000 pastries, about 10,000 pretzels. And uh, one of the things we use at Farmer's Market is we make apple strudel and six-foot-long loaves, I guess you'd call them. Uh, we sold over 600 feet of that last year. And that was just the eye catcher to get people to, to see what's going on at our booth and, and draw their attention. Being in the, the wonderful bread basket of the US, the si this uh, grain facility in the lower right is a very common, common site. These are set up to handle 110 car train car loads of grain at a time. That's the most efficient to move grain in and out of the, out of the area. But the irony of this is that none of the products that go through these things are fit for human consumption. And the biggest irony is 
they don't see a problem with that. I was talking to some of the state people and encouraging them to look at local grains and, and uh, maybe getting into some sort of situation to foster local grain in, in uh, not only South Dakota. North Dakota is way far ahead of where South Dakota is. It's just not going to happen without us stepping in and, and uh, doing it ourselves. There was a huge tipping point for me. And the huge tipping point was this picture on the left. A lot of times people look at a picture like this and say, oh, that's just romantic, that amber waves of grain. I look at that and say, oh my goodness, tracks in grain that's just about ready to be harvested. That picture represents what I call, it's about what's referred to as the 30% dough stage. That's, that's when grain is set in the head and it's just about, it's starting to get into that process of drying down so that it can be harvested. When you see tracks like that through the grain, it means it's been sprayed. Now, why would you spray grain with typically glyphosate when glyphosate has a 40 day, four, about a 47 day average residue in the soil at least, why would you spray it within one or two weeks of it being harvested? Well, I went back through that area about a week and a half later and it was harvested. So that was the tipping point for me because then I said to myself, where did that glyphosate go? Well, we know where it went. So that was kind of the tipping point for us or, or uh, impetus for us to really look hard to see what we could do to secure not only our, our grain supply as a whole, but what could we do to focus in on this? We realize that there's a lot of benefits to be had. Anecdotally, for years we've had people come up to our farmer's market booth and say, your pasta, it's different. I don't have that heavy feeling. I don't have that glycemic load. Or, I know I wouldn't recommend this necessarily, but we even have people who are uh, gluten intolerant and, and even more so come up to us and say, I don't have the same reactions. Now again, that's anecdotally, but I believe that part of that has to do with the way it's grown and the genetics, the genetic itself. As bakers, as people that are involved in pasta production, food production, there is a fact that we need to come to grips with. People will often, at least for the most part, work on this, this concept that perception is reality. If someone thinks it, it is. So what we need to do as, as bakers, as pasta makers, as people who are involved with food production is present the very best possible. And we walk them through the process, and I'll get to that in a minute. The customers then are going to turn around and they're going to share that excitement. They share it back with us, reflecting back what they experience. And then they're going to turn around and, and reflect that to other people. That's been our best source of advertisement. Now, again, I'm, I'm kind of envious when there's good flour to be had very close. We don't have that option. So we've turned our attention to working with farmers individually and we're pre-ordering the flour, the, the grains. We're forward contracting our grains. We forward contracted wheat, uh, some heritage varieties of wheat so that we have that supply available. We forward contracted some emmer, some einkorn, even lentils and flax and other things so that we know not only the quality of the product, but we actually know the guys that's, that are growing it. It's wonderful, wonderful experience. Because what we're finding is that the grain is the expression of the land that grows it. That's very important because that's where the taste comes from. So what are we going to do with these ancient grains once we have them? We've, we've contracted a lot of grain. Well, we're going to put it in everything that we possibly can because we believe in it that much. Now, we see the results. But if we have the grain, that's only part of it. I've got three point, uh, five points listed on the screen, and those five points are from Chad Robertson of Tartine Bakery fame. And by the way, we were there a few years ago, and we couldn't get through the door because there was such a line. Wonderful products. He lists five points as being necessary when working with these local ancient heritage-identified grains. 
need to use fresh milled grain. You need to think outside of the box. And what does he mean by that? We can't just bake off of a recipe. So much of the baking in the past has been using a recipe and baking off that recipe. That was fine and is fine if you're in a commodity baking environment, but there's so many other factors that come into play, and I believe that one of the biggest factors is the nutrient density of that particular grain and then, therefore, that particular flour. So you need to use every tool possible to coax out the flavor. It might mean making a porridge. It might mean using a pre-ferment. It might mean using a certain kind of sour. We, we run four different kinds of sours right now, and each one is good for a different particular purpose. Use different grinds of flour, different blends of flour. All these things are at our disposal. The third point, Chad emphasizes using a lo young leaven to have a good taste, to, to, to play down the sour part of it. We have a pretty large building now, and this is point four. We cannot air condition it. And some summers here are just absolutely brutal. We, uh, last year we saw about a week and a half where it was over 115 degrees, and that's the temperature inside the bakery. And I hear some of you probably gasping, saying, how do you control things? It's really difficult. We've learned to use refrigeration. We've, we have some strange cooling techniques that we use because, we're, we're, again, we're new. We don't have our, all our equipment. But we've figured out ways to get around this to, to lower the temperature, to slow down the processes. Got to pay attention to the weather. If there's a storm moving in, it changes the way things bake out. The fifth point. Chad emphasizes, look at sourcing. Look at where your flour comes from. Look at how you store it. We, uh, two, three years ago, we had a problem where we didn't have our flour properly stored. It was stored in a what we thought was a secure environment, but it wasn't. We had to throw it out because it got buggy. That was a, a really big expense of going to school to learn learn what to do and what not to do. All these points drive the way the thing, the, the baked goods taste. And I use just as an example, consider farm fresh eggs versus store eggs. Hands down, there's no comparison. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do to go forward? It's tempting to hold back and, and, and because of the cost, not go forward with, with using local grains, using ancient grains, using heritage-identified grains. But part of the reason we do this, the part of the reason we bake, is to make sales. That's not wrong. But it's not easy to overcome that mentally sometimes. But if we break out of the commodity baking and food making mindset, we gain a lot. We gain a pride in the quality of taste that we present. We gain sustainable prices for us and our suppliers, that's the farm, and appreciation for the land that produces the unique flavors and varieties that we need for flavors. This all has to do with a sense of place. We sure, we start out with eye candy. We start out wanting to draw people's attention by what the thing looks like. So we use a lot of color or we'll try to use the shape of a product. There are all sorts of things that we can come into play with, but that's only the first step. That's what draws people's attention. But our customers now are some of the most savvy customers that have ever existed. Don't let them down. You can draw their attention with packaging. You can draw their attention with what your, your, your retail area looks like or what you present at farmer's market, but don't stop there. That's, that's really important. Um, using these grains gives us an advantage. It gives us an underpinning. The, the location, the sense of taste, the terroir, comes across in many different ways. The bottom line is where a particular grain is grown, that local grain will take on the effects of the area that it's grown in. This is really important because the grain that's grown in New York is going to taste different than the grain that's grown in the Dakotas. That's okay. The location, just like in wine, has a bearing on the taste. And so we're 
the ones that are called to coax out those tastes and to present them to the customer. Again, these flavors can underpin, but they can't substitute for quality. What about the positive effects? There are very few negative effects, except that the recipes are a little difficult to work with. You need to coax out the things, that, coax out the flavors, coax out the crumb, coax out the crust. That's fine. But remember Chad Robertson's five points. Fresh milled grain, think outside the box, use a young leaven, keep in mind the weather and environment that you're working with and your sourcing and storage. It's just wonderful. It's a great thing for us because, again, most of our products are presented in the farmer's market scenario. It's great to get feedback. People come up to us and say, you know, I don't get that heavy feeling when I eat your bread or when I eat your pasta. Thank you. Your bread, it makes my mouth tingle. Really? Okay. Your challah, it's just like what we buy in New York. And we say thank you, and then to ourselves we say, yeah, but we've got a long way to go because we know we're just young. We're new at this. That's okay. They can say that, and we can say thank you. Or we tried last year, we tried a, a, a local flower, a heritage grain called Clark's Cream Wheat. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and people would come back to us again and say, do you have any of that Clark's Cream Wheat in, in, in your breads? It's a picture of it in the lower left here. We, we did a Clark's cream wheat, and then we, we put flax in it and on, on top. It was wonderful. It's kind of amazing to us, and it's almost strange to hear people say, I can taste a little bit of butter in this. Did you put butter in that? No, it's a lean dough. Why does that taste like chocolate or apricot or cherry or apple or molasses or honey or clover? Those flavors are coming out from those grains. Is that bizarre? No. That's what these genetics were created to do, and all we're doing is, as bakers, as pasta makers, is bringing them, that, bringing them out there. That's what is for, uh, that, that's the purpose. So again, why do we use these grains? Flavor and nutrient benefits. We could spill a lot of ink or, or take a lot of time talking about the flavor benefits. I've touched on some of those. The nutrient benefits, especially if we're working with farmers that know how to work the land, it's going to be a nutritionally dense product, and that comes out in the taste. Anecdotally, we can get more rise in oven spring from nutrient-dense grains. We had a strange experience just the other day. We were baking a batch of of emmer and blended wheat to make a, a, a German style hard roll, it rose up too much on us. We, we can tweak that around, but it was too soft to be qualified as a German hard roll, a German dense, dense roll, a brochen. That's okay. We made a little discovery. Move on. Through these local grains, the ancient heritage identified grains, we can escape the hybridization that many of us find so problematic. We could talk a lot about that, but let me consolidate that down into the concept of this. If we know who's, who our, our grain farmer is, who's raising our grains, there's an interaction there. They know what we want. We can tell them. It's a wonderful experience. Because then they say, oh, well, we never knew that. We are picking off of agronomy characteristics. But if we know that you want this to do, do this, have this particular attribute, well, great, we'll do that. We're in the baby steps of this, but it's working. It's wonderful. The next one, people are identifying and do want products that are local, ancient, heritage identified. When we can tell them, yeah, we have these products, and we know right where they come from. We're working out a program with a QR code on our packaging so that they can click on the QR code and zoom in on the, on the farm and see a picture of the farmer that's, that's actually raising their grain. We feel this is part of that transparency process that modern customers need to know and want to know. Now, this is a picture of one of our farmer's markets booth in the lower right. 
if we don't have a, at least five people in front of our booth, it feels awkward. And it's, it's, it's because people are drawn to our products. And hopefully every year we can ratchet up the process here to make them want to come back more and more and tell their friends, tell their relatives, they have a product that's different. And it's okay if they don't necessarily know why it's different, but they're drawn to it because of the taste. One of the things that we've just tapped into is we're making our bakery available to um, the people at Northern Plains Sustainable Ag. We want to have this give and take relationship. We want to give feedback to the farmers and we want to hear what their thought processes are so that we can walk lockstep. Just like Stefan talked about, just like Peter talked about, we need that interaction. And so this is our outlet for interaction. We want to hear what they are, are, are breeding for the next up and coming wheat, emmer, einkorn, spelt projects. And I, I'm really looking forward to beginning this process so that we can have an interaction and they say, oh, well, we didn't realize this is what you wanted. Or we may say the same thing to them. Uh, I, I want to give a shout out right now to Frank Kutka and, and Steve Swinger for, for their hard work in this. Just, just some examples down the side there of what they're working on. Emmer, 117 varieties. Einkorn, 97. Spelt, 67 varieties. These are ongoing processes. And they're also working on things that aren't even listed. Sorghum, buckwheat, and flax. These are all great things. And uh, I may be overstating this a little bit, but I believe that this is where we need to focus. I'm excited about it. And I really believe that this is the way we need to go. Now, again, New York, Vermont, a lot of local milling going on. West Coast, same thing. Arizona, same thing. Carolinas, a lot of local milling going on. It seems like, though, in the mid-continent, we don't have much going on. So we know that one of the elements that, that we're weak on is, is the fresh milled aspect. So we're, lo we're looking at our own milled project. And uh, we feel that we can't go to that next level until we can mill in-house. So our, our focus is this. Our focus is that we want to make single source origin grains readily available. Just like you'd, you'd hear from Napa, Sonoma, a particular variety of wine, that's what we want to do with, with uh, wheat and with uh, local heritage, ancient grains. The idea is that not only for us, but also for other people, because we know on the mid-continent, this is not as available. So we're thinking in terms of things like Emmer, Emmer pizza flour, double lot, einkorn, maybe uh, hit more of the ethnic markets. Instead of doing cinnamon rolls, we would do einkorn sumac rolls. We have a huge market in the Middle Eastern framework of, of thinking. They use so wonderful grains, teff, uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. A, a lot of grains that, that we don't even touch right now. How about if we had available bread flour using a combination of dill and wheat and einkorn? looking at high and low uh, protein content. Uh, we're, we're working on some projects right now where we're going to be growing out, trying to enlarge the seed so that we can grow uh, at a field level some of the grains that were used in the past, like rivet. That's just one of our test plots. We have started, and the, I, the idea is to, to, to be an incubator. If you go to Facebook, you'll see Heritage Grain Exchange. The idea is to be a kind of an incubator to exchange ideas, to exchange on a limited basis, exchange the grain itself, to say, hey, I've got this over here. Hey, people over here can, can maybe grind this grain for us. It's kind of a conduit to go back and forth. At least in the mid-continent, we don't have the accessibility to a lot of these things that, that we see in the East Coast, West Coast. So that's just our little work of... of uh, trying to get these, these local grains more available in the area where everybody looks at commodity grains. I appreciate you listening. I know I talked fast, but 
that's who I am. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, Steve. Yep. Hi, uh, Steve Gonzalez of uh, Svalini Pasta Shop in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we've been in business for about three and a half years. Um, primarily, our focus when we started was doing uh, delivering fresh pasta to restaurants around uh, the boroughs. And as we kind of grew, we grew into uh, extruded dry pasta. Um, and that right now is about 65% uh, of our business and the, biz the part of our business that's uh, growing rapidly. Um, we, we got about 10 employees. We operate about out of 4,000 square feet, and uh, we are currently, our pasta is currently in 42 states. Um, and uh, so a little bit about the, uh, the shop, uh, we'll kind of go into this. So we have some, for us, uh, I think, you know, a lot of these, the bakers, uh, they have a little bit uh, difficulty uh, with a lot of variables. Um, we are somewhat kind of on the opposite. We, we, we work very concisely. Everything's measured. We usually run at hydrations of between um, 27 to 32 percent for all of our extruded pastas. Um, yeah, we, and so we'll go first. Uh, I think we can see that there's our pasta extruder. Uh, which we're kind of outgrowing right now. That one does about 150 pounds an hour. And um, as you can see next to it, we only use uh, bronze dyes, which kind of give the pasta the, the rough, porous texture. And then everything that we do is uh, up above is our new uh, dryers, and we can dry, uh, we can yield about uh, 500 pounds of uh, dry pasta per room. So right now our, our like daily production is about a thousand pounds and uh, we're currently producing uh, anywhere from five, mostly seven days a week, uh, turning out pasta. Uh, so to the, to the flowers, we kind of Along with Peter and Stefan, we we probably use a lot of the same guys. We we get a lot of our stuff from Farmer Ground, um, especially. Uh, so we use our our whole grain, which is a mix of spring and winter wheat. Um, rye is coming from them, uh, and then we use not pictured. We use uh, Champlain Valley for uh, emmer and einkorn, and then our bulk product that we use the most of is probably is coming from North Dakota. That's our semolina, which is kind of led of how we got into finding the local grains when we first started. We were looking for locally sourced semolina. Uh, we found out that it doesn't do very well uh, here in New York. In doing that, we met a lot of great people who started telling us about their flowers, and we had the idea of starting to incorporate uh, those flowers into our organic product, our, our semolina product. So we do do 100% organic semolina pasta, and then we do incorporate all these other grains. And whenever we incorporate a local grain, we try to use, we do use a higher percentage of that. So we, so all of our pastas that use local grains are blended. And we usually run at a 60-40 or a 70-30 blend, again, in favor of the local grains. Um, we find that adding the semolina to the, um, to the base helps give the pasta some structure and dough, uh, gives some structure, uh, especially when it's recooked. Uh, we've done some tests with 100%. And... Um, the mouthfeel just wasn't quite there. It's very uh, soft and, and mushy. And then, uh, so I think you can see these are, well, I shouldn't say, everything coming from uh, farmer ground flour is stone, and then a bulk of what happens over at Champlain Valley is, uh, is roller milled. 
and then so this is a this is our extruder uh, at work. This is a shape called uh, Campanelli, and the uh, the dough, as you can see, is a little darker. Um, and that is the uh, whole grain trumpets. Then, uh, as you can see here, we have a slide of our our products, and then as uh, moving around up top is the Emma Reginetti, which is uh, one of our, our our best sellers. The whole grain Spocatelli also sells very well. Uh, the whole wheat radiators and the trump and the rye trumpets uh, all perform uh, very well for us. Um, the hardest the hardest part, kind of going into these uh, customer things, is I think uh, a lot of people from either growing up have a lot of bad experiences with uh, whole grain. Uh, whole wheat pastas, um, and they find them to be very heavy and dense, and uh, a lot of people tell us cardboard flavor. So we do have a bit of a struggle trying to get people to taste these, but once we can get it into the to the mouth, we we usually see that they have a good experience, and it's very easy to sell them a return visit on that. And then uh, just to kind of sum up a little bit here, so in, in 2015, we made about 250,000 pounds of pasta. We used about 30,000 pound, 30, pounds of uh, local grains. And uh, just to kind of some problems that we've had uh, working with these local grains, uh, and it's mostly kind of the Echo uh, Peter is, was uh, a couple years ago. We had a lot of inconsistency issues, and uh, I think just in part from uh, working with the, with uh, Greg over at Farmer Ground and being in contact with him, we've been able to to work through a lot of those um, milling inconsistencies. Uh, one thing it's it's very important for us to have a a good uh, consistent grind because uh, our our opening on our, our dies is very compact, so if there's anything that's kind of missed in sifting, it can plug up our machines and uh, kind of cause a big delay in, in production. Um, and then, you know, the, the and then the biggest problem we've had as we as our business grows and we get into these more um, commercial markets. And we're more into uh, labeling. Is that you know we found that the the USDA really uh, uh, all these uh, nutritional informations that you see on the you know we always wanted to see if we wanted to put the to see if our pasta was actually more nutritious if it's local and we're using these these grains. But um, a lot of what the USDA does is uh, categorize us. And uh, give, they give us generic information, so it's, it was up to us to kind of go out there and uh, find results. So we're waiting to hear back on those. And um, that's uh, that's it for me. Okay, thank you all. If you have general questions about organic farming, um, you're always welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service and you will get an answer. So um, there have been some people typing in questions, so um, let's move on to those. And first question, are you, if you make bread with 100% whole wheat at all, um, do you um, have problems with dense bread? And if so, what types of yeast do you use? I can speak for the Wide Awake Bakery if I can jump into this. We do make uh, whole grain bread, 100% uh, whole wheat bread. Um, of course, it's always going to be a little bit more dense than a bolted flour or a white flour just because the particles of bran will pierce the gluten so you lose gas. Um, and you also have other issues. You know, there's, you know, there's more enzyme activity and more rapid fermentation. If you don't watch it, you can go over very quickly and the, the enzyme activity can... Uh, attack the protein, so it's it's just a little bit uh, touchier and requires more uh, more sensitivity. Uh, we haven't had much of a problem. Um, like our breads 
uh, the whole wheat breads are all, I'm always amazed. I've never really liked whole wheat bread very much, but ours have been coming out great. Um, and I know a lot of folks who are doing in-house milling are making uh, much better whole wheat bread than we are, in part because that flour is super fresh, being ground right into the bowl, and that seems to have a, a salutary effect on the bread. And that's it from the Wide Awake Bakery. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else can feel free to jump in. Um, okay. Um, almost all the technical literature has supported the tenet that green flowers don't perform well. I've done trials using fresh flowers, and they do seem to have issues with water absorption and lack strength. Yet I rare, and I'm talking for the questioner here. Yet I really rarely hear bakers who are using fresh ground flowers mention this. Have you guys experienced this? And if so, how do you get around it? I can talk again. I don't want to monopolize Peter or if anybody else wants to jump in here. All uh, right, we don't actually, yeah, we don't use fresh ground flour. Our, all of ours is at least a week old, I think, by the time we get it from farmer ground. So if, if you do it, you probably have more to say about it. Okay. Well, um, our experience is that at the very beginning, um, I'll reprint it. Uh, at the very beginning, we were very concerned about this, and we did feel like we were having issues. And then um, we uh, started controlling for it. You know, we would make sure we were stacking our flour, and that it was sitting on the floor longer, and so forth and so on. Uh, and then basically, we became better bakers, <laughs> and now we don't have any problems anymore. Um, you know, honestly, so much of this stuff is, uh, in my opinion, is that most of us grew up, we learned to bake with very, very high quality, very um, uh, extraordinarily forgiving roller milled flour. So we began with King Arthur, which is, you know, you know, uh, it's an awesome flour. Honestly, you can hardly do anything wrong. I mean, you can hardly blow it. And so we developed this sense of baking that's fairly loose, you know, by the seat of the pants. And when you start getting to, with, you start getting more active flowers and flowers with more bran and that are different degrees of enzyme activity and all these other things that happen with fresher uh, whole grain flowers and stone ground flowers, they challenge you as a baker. And so you, we had all kinds of problems at the beginning and it was just a, it was just skill and it wasn't science. It wasn't that we solved the problems. It's just, we got better and the problems walked away. What, well what were the problems, Stefan, if you if you could tell us, of using a green, freshly milled flour? Was it too active or what yeah, was so, the so, uh Well, first, let me just note, though, that that in, in my analysis now is there was no problem. It was our problem being sensitive bakers. Mostly it had to do with uh, two things. Um, really a kind of gumminess in the flour where the, the, or the in the dough where you hydrate it, and right away you can feel it in your hands. It's super sticky and uh, in a wheat dough that shouldn't be that sticky. And then uh, it maintains that stickiness throughout the fermentation and through the proof. And that, you know, we always figure that was greenness. Uh, we have experienced the thing that we are always, we call false hydration. We don't, we don't know exactly. Sometimes we have problems with the, um, with our uh, wheat breads sweating. So that, and by that I mean they'll, they go into a long cold proof in a basket on a couche, and when you actually go to bake them, the couche is sopping wet. A lot of the water has come out of the dough uh, and is in the couche. We don't actually know what that is. We have a lot of theories. Uh, as we become better bakers, it kind of just, we just go, okay, well, that's just part of it. You know, the bread is still great. That's just how it works. Um, so we learn how to you know, handle the bread differently. At first, if there's any wetness on the bread, it tends to stick. It'll stick to your hand. It'll stick to the peel. It'll stick to the razor blade and so on. And then you just develop your technique and then the, all those problems disappear. You just sort of say, well, that's, that's how it is. Does that help? So we have wet water that emerges from the dough and we have uh, stickiness th throughout from right from the beginning of mix all the way through uh, to baking. I would really encourage people to look at a recipe in terms of the baseline, realizing that you need to experiment and go off of that because different grains have different characters of development. And we're, we're so young at this, but we're realizing that you can't treat one recipe the same for, for every grain. There's different expressions that happen. And I would really encourage people to use pre-ferments also. 
Okay, um, we have some pasta questions here. Um, so the first one of those is, um, how long are pastas dried before packaging and what kind of shelf life um, do you get from the ancient grain pasta? Uh, sure, so, uh, well, we our pasta is about, we run about a 15 hour cycle. Uh, not going over 105 degrees, uh, mostly because that's where a lot of all these uh, things, uh, especially like natural niacin, riboflavin, uh, those those things all start to break down at, at above those temperatures. Uh, our shelf life, once you know, that, that's kind of the advantage uh, that we have uh, that the bakers don't have is it's selling a dry product. Uh, it's pretty shelf stable. We recommend to, it to be used within a year, but we have some bags hanging around the shop that we just kind of keep an eye on that are well over a year old that we eat occasionally, and I don't see that uh, a difference in it from the product that we made day one to a product that's uh, a little bit older. Okay, and do you think there's a difference? We, we make but, oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, we, we have the same experience. We make a dried pasta. We don't have a dryer, so ours dries in the ambient, so it usually takes up to 48 hours, but it's basically infinite shelf life. Okay, so you don't find that the stone milled flour pasta have a shorter shelf life than conventional dried pasta? No. Uh, no, no. The, the act of raw material does, but not the, not the finished product, no. Okay, and That's here's a great another question, though. Yeah. Okay, sorry, it's kind of hard to tell who's talking. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so for pasta making, um, could you please say how long you wait between hydrating the flour and extruding the pasta, and what temperature the water is used for the hydration? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we use we use a cold cold uh, water from a you know New York City tap water mm -hmm. uh, to be to be frank. Um, and we do not uh, the dough it mixes and then uh, you know probably mixes for about five minutes and then goes straight goes straight to the extruder. There's there's no uh, we don't rest it. Uh, it's it's a pretty continuous process for us. Okay, Dan, did you want to add to that at all? Um, I was just curious, Steve. Do you see any differences with the the, the blending levels? Do you see any stickiness develop? Uh, actually, the only one that we really see that can uh, emmer can kind of be overmixed is the one thing that we've we've seen. Uh, other than that, everything uh, you know, we just adjust uh, mostly to the batch. But right now, I would say that all all of our recipes uh, have been showing pretty consistent uh, for the last year. So there's really not too much uh, modifications we're we're making right now. Excellent. Okay, and one more pasta question. Um, are there any tips for drying pasta shapes so that they don't crack? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, uh, you, well, drying pasta is, is the most difficult thing um, and is has been the most challenging thing. So, you know, when we first started, uh, we were drying in an ambient room and uh, I mean, we were had humidifiers running. We had hot water boiling to try to keep it up. So you mostly, and then you know, if it dries too, if it's too humid and it dries too slow, you get molding. If it dries too fast and there's not enough humidity, you get cracking, which is very, um, it's very typical or checking as they call in the business and pretty much if you boil that pasta you get soup in the in the water um, I mean and then we kind of went to we modified a, a walking cooler that had a heater and humidified air and that got us uh, some better consistency um, and now we kind of went to uh, we kind of have like an off-the-shelf uh, Italian uh, it's called a static dryer, and uh, that kind of mimics um, what our old room used to do. It's just a little more, it's better insulated, and just uh, 
is a little more consistent than our uh, prior room. And uh, right now we've and we've been on this these dryers since right before Thanksgiving, and we have very uh, consistent uh, results now. Uh, very good results. It's been a great. It's been really great uh, increase in our production and and, and a lot of, uh, less uh, waste. Nice. What what Steve is is talking toward? We've experienced the very same thing, and something that that did help us. And we, when we learned that pasta, especially the small cups, needs to dry from the inside out, then all of a sudden the light bulb came on and we're drying the outside first. And that causes checking and, and some of these things. Uh, we had a really bad incident where we delivered pasta to a restaurant and it did turn into a mush. It turned into a porridge. So we had to redo the batch, but then we had to, we actually did build a little tent and put a little boiling pot of water under it. And, same thing. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of no. Usually, I mean, well, when you get into these industrial guys, like the Barillas and these, you know, mass-producing guys, you know, their their cycles are usually anywhere from two to five hours in drying, and they're running at temperatures of over 200 degrees. But for the more on the slower end, you know, you really want to be anywhere between 98 and 112 degrees and, you know, uh, decreasing your humidity as your cycle goes. So you usually want to start somewhere around 70% uh, humidity and then kind of taper it off uh, as, as the cycle uh, moves on. And, and, yeah, like I said, with our machines now, we have uh, a very good control panel on it that allows us to, to, to do this. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so we have some farmers online, and there, there are two that are asking kind of a similar question, even though they're in different areas. We have one from the Salinas Valley in California and another one from Iowa. And um, one of them wants to grow heritage grains, and the other one already does. And um, the one in Salinas has a stone mill and custom mills grains as they're ordered. And so um, both of them are interested in connecting um, and raising interest in local bakers like yourself. So do you have any suggestions on how they can do that? I don't know if Elizabeth wants to weigh in on this one too. Sorry, what's the, what's the question? The question they, is they how can they um, improve um, sales or connect with bakers like you to buy their products? Well, call us on the phone. <laughs> I mean, you can, <laughs> seriously, I mean, you know, yeah. you join the Bread Bakers Guild of America you go to the kneading conference. If you're out on the West Coast, I would go talk to Steve Jones. I would go to the San Francisco Baking Institute. I would go, go. there are plenty of really brilliant, brilliant bakers on the West Coast. Um, and you can just go and visit them. They're, the bakers are, uh, by nature, quite generous. I mean, they've elected to give away like 80% of their time on the planet to bake bread for other people. So that's sort of a natural habit of bakers to be generous. So if you call them and, and tell them that you want to talk with them, they tend to say yes. I would also say just get involved with whatever farmer's markets are nearby. I feel like if you approach a baker at a farmer's market and say, here's some flour I'm milling, um, that to me seems like a, a no-brainer in terms of establishing a relationship, um, especially because then you'll be sure to have people that are, are going to be local to you, whereas Bread Bakers Guild as a national organization might yeah. You might find a lot of the people are out of your service area. <laughs> to the Iowa farmer, I would encourage them to look at the St. Paul Bread Club or just get a hold of me and we can talk. Great. Thanks for those suggestions. I mean, it may be seem obvious, but I guess it isn't if you're not in that world. So, um, yeah, thanks thanks for addressing those. Um, has Let me just, say, sorry. just kind of address that generosity issue is that I have I – have, I think we all have. There's a there's a some tradition of bakers visiting each other all around the country, and there's a lot of welcoming going on. And so I think if you just call a baker up and you know you're respectful of time and busyness and so on, you will find a welcome, and and then you can go and talk and bring flour and give it away, and it, it's surprisingly easy. Great. Um, let's see. Um, has anyone here done any calculations on how many acres of grain production you would 
need to meet your needs for flour. So for example, if you need 30,000 pounds, um, how many acres could a farmer make a living providing you with grain? How many acres would be needed? Have you done anything like that? Uh, no, I haven't. I know this is the first year that we've, we've ran into the shortage issues that was what we've had to besides our traditional besides besides the semolina we've had to look uh to maine and uh yeah pretty maine uh as a as an alternative source uh and then the other supply chain issue which really isn't local grain is our organic semolina which is skyrocketing in price uh it's, it's tripled in price over the last three years and uh, so now we're working with some people in Maine to try to grow semolina uh, in, in that state. One of the discussions that we had quite extensively at the Northern Plains Conference was the fact that farmers are paid off of the price that they get off the field. And that depends whether it's meant destined for flour or destined for seed. And so really, as a baker, I'm competing, competing with seed price which is often quite a bit higher than, than what would be destined for flower price. But you know what? That's okay. That's okay because the benefits, I think, are they far outstrip the cost factor. And uh, we, we suggest at the rate of uh, yield at 30 bushel, you gotta, you got to kind of gear a little bit low, 30 bushel an acre, you should be able to, uh, 160 acres should be sustainable. And um, it just depends on, on what your lifestyle is, but but that should be a very healthy living outside of uh, outside of subsidies, outside of realizing that wheat right now I think is about 440 a bushel for conventional. So those have to be a factor, but we need to realize that as bakers, if we want a good product, we pay, and that's fine. We I feel that's a privilege. This is Elizabeth. I just wanted to say here from the farmer baker perspective that's why it's so important that the, the bakers and the and the pasta makers um, stay in constant contact with the farmers because uh, Dan was saying you know a, a yield for a spring wheat I'm, I'm taking that to be spring wheat of about 30 bushels an acre sometimes in the east here will will be especially will be much lower than that um, and then there can be other disease issues too so production is going to is always going to vary um, because of the risks weather risks associated with it so That's right. one of the key things is to keep in, in constant contact and forward contact with your growers so you know what what's uh, what to expect yeah someone just brought up um, issues of um, you know dealing with diseases that are prevalent often in the Northeast, where there's wetter summers like Fusarium head blight and uh, the DONS funds uh, levels. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if that um, has affected some of your uh, millers. Fusarium, at least for the the growers, is a is a reality. And so we're really encouraging people to look backwards to pre. NPK era genetics. So, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, it seems like those are, are more the heritage identified grains. If they are properly, if, the, if they're given the right soil amendments, don't have lodging, which is very typical, or they don't have the fusarium issues. And that sounds like I'm speaking hocus pocus, hocus pocus, but the guys that have high BRICS level crops don't experience some of those things. Now, and to be sure, we're in a different um, moisture area than, than the Northeast, for instance. You know, the area that we're in, in particular, has about 26 inches of rain a year. Now, more to the north gets into that 16-inch rain. So that does come into play. But nutrition is paramount. My, from my, my take on it is that basically we are looking at a new, a new future here. I mean, uh, you know, the climate is changing extremely rapidly, and so basically, I, I feel like, well, you know, at least in our case here, it's having close communication with our farmer and our miller, and a degree of uh, commitment among all of us to try to make the thing work. So we're willing to, you know, search out that wheat, try to uh, pay people a higher price for it. Um, we're, you know, committed to getting the grain to the mill, committed to getting the flour to the bakery. So there's a there's a little bit of um, 
I don't know, spreading the stress around or something. But anyway, I look ahead and I, I don't, uh, to, to me it looks like a lot of unknowns ahead. So um, here's a question about milling. For, the, for those that mill their flour in-house, um, what kind of mill do you use? And do you have any recommendations for someone who might be purchasing a mill? Uh, we don't mill in house here. Uh, the 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 best mill stuff that I know that's going on. Um, uh, Andrew Hine up at uh, Elmore Mountain Bread has been working on you know developing really nice mills for in house milling at the bakery. And I would contact him directly. Uh, great guy and um, and. Could you uh, repeat that again, please? Sorry. Yeah, uh, Andrew Hine at Elmore Mountain Bread um, has been. Uh, working with folks at Bolted Bread and some other bakeries to develop um, a really ideal design for a you know mid-sized mill to to do in-house milling for small bakeries. So I would talk to him. Okay. Um, are you as bakers asking for protein and falling number testing on all your flours? And um, do you see a lot of variation from year to year, or are your millers blending flowers from different farms to achieve consistency in those stats? Um, I, I, this is Peter. Um, I can tell you that I think for us, we, the only flower that we're concerned with the protein content on uh, in falling number was our white flower, uh, just because that winds up being the structural workhorse in any of our breads that um, that have mixed grains in them and then for the other flowers uh, we kind of just take what we're given and, and work around um, work around that I don't even know that that information is available from our local suppliers perhaps Champlain Valley milling I think they produce those uh, metrics but I don't believe farmer ground flour does but uh, I feel like for the whole grain flowers it, it's a little less important because you're expecting uh, less out of them in terms of structure and you're kind of expecting more fermentation so uh, a measure of fermentation in the falling number wouldn't necessarily be super useful uh, that's been my experience but uh, Stefan yeah uh, so farmer ground does test for falling number does test for protein and also lately um, uh, testing for starch damage and, um, and and I was just over there and you know uh, uh, Benny handed me a uh, sheet of all the plausible, all the available tests, and there, there are hundreds of them I'd never even heard of, and said, you know, what do you want? <laughs> like, I, don't know, I don't know what half of these things are. Anyway, um, so they do blend for, for falling numbers, so they're always in the zone. Every once in a while, they'll get a batch of wheat that comes in, and uh, it'll be, you know, off the charts in one direction or another, and they will blend for that. Protein, I don't believe they're blending for, but it's been relatively stable and certainly strong enough uh, for our uses, lower than... Um, then, for example, King Arthur, um, for us, that's a good thing. That makes our work easier. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, the, there's there are of course some other tests, but those those two they they, they do those tests and, and and yeah. So Peter, if you wanted those numbers, they would get them for you. Great, thanks. Uh, Dan here, I would encourage if it's if it's on the farmer end, rather than looking toward the potential. Uh, ash number or something like that, look to bricks. Make sure your product is a, a high bricks. That's going to reflect out in the bakeability of the of the flour. Okay, um, let's see. Here's a question about how you try to implement the way of thinking um, to customers of using local and organic um, flour, and uh, have you ever thought of removing for a short period of time your white flour baguettes to force people to go to your whole grain bread? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Um, I, I guess I, I go. Oh, you want to take this? No, step go on? for it, man. Go for it. Sure, go for it. Oh. We'll both do it. You go for it. First. Yeah, I was. I was just going to say. Um, that's an interesting idea. Removing the white flour baguettes. I think. Certainly at the end of the day when we're sold out of white baguettes, people quote-unquote settle for other breads. I don't know if it me means return customers necessarily, but uh, but I think it's definitely true that once a bakery has a following, I think its customers can be very loyal, and so it, you do have a little bit of potential to kind of guide them. Uh, I feel like 
we do that in in so much as we add. Uh, I try and incorporate whole grain in whatever I can, um, and the whole grain being the local flour. And I think I do that more in the sweets department. So, for example, we have a, a chocolate brownie that's 100% rye flour. Um, we have shortbreads that we make with 100% whole wheat flour, and um, I think that that helps uh, increase the amount of local flour we're using. And I don't want to call it tricking the customer, but certainly gets them to uh, eat their local whole grain flours, whether or not they were seeking to. <laughs> like sneaking in those vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. In our experience, when we started the bread distributions, when we just started up, people almost they they really they really went for the lighter breads, either a white bread or a a, a white with some you know 30% local flour or something like that. Uh, and very quickly, maybe after six months, they'd start coming in and say, "Well, I don't know, where's some of this uh, this local flour bread?" We say, "Well, you've been eating it all along, but why don't you try this one? It's got some more in it." And at this point. Our white breads are a very small proportion of our breads overall, probably 30%. So we, everything else is at least 70%. Well, maybe that's I should I never actually calculated that because we have some breads that are in the 30 to 40% range of local whole flour, all the way up to 100%. Those breads are the ones that really really move. There's there's still a nice reaction to a white focaccia, but uh, in in general. That whole our whole market has shifted over towards the grainier and more local side, just through time, just through appreciation and time spent getting used to bread again. You got to remember, all these folks have been weaned off of bread and onto this squishy stuff for many, many years, and it takes a while to break them of that. Yeah, that's definitely true. I would second that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what kind of wheat is in your white flour? <laughs> God only knows. <laughs> You'll notice the silence on my end. Uh, the, the wheat kind? I don't know. The wheat kind, exactly. Yes, yeah, so all that stuff is blended at these huge, you know, at these huge, uh, you know, huge mills. We have no idea. I have no idea. I know y'all maybe know, but I don't know. Okay. No. Um, if your loaf sells for four dollars, how much does your flour cost? I know one person mentioned the baguette. Yeah. Um, I th I think that our uh, local flowers cost almost a dollar a pound. So if it's a 400, 400 gram loaf, um, I just don't, don't have a calculator in front of me. Uh, let me see. If it's a 400 gram loaf, and we'll say that it's 30%. 400 gram loaf. Uh, I like the suggestion about the metric system. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say. Like the flour pounds. itself is probably costing about uh, tw the whole grain flour in in a 400 gram loaf is probably costing uh, close to a dollar. Okay. So no, yeah. no, and no, I mean, the, no, you don't think so? Wait for for a for, yeah, yeah, could, could. for 100 percent whole grain. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> that sounds okay. Okay, I think we have time for a last question, and that is, um, how do you work with plant breeders, if at all? I know Dan mentioned he works with the um, Northern Plains um, Sustainable Agriculture Group. Yeah, can I can I just go back to oh, that sure. prior question right. about price for one second? So, because we have a somewhat different approach to this. First of all, we sell all our breads for more than that. Um, so we we have our bread CSA, right? So the people who are members. So we have a retail price, which is what we sell at, if you walk up to the table and you know we've never met, you're going to pay six dollars and fifty cents for a loaf, and it doesn't matter what loaf it is unless it's a great big one, in which case you pay more. So you'll pay six fifty for a baguette. You know, that's where we're that's at. That's a lot. That's a and lot. That's a, and that's a pound loaf, or that's that's not even a pound. That's a small okay. baguette. And folks will say six fifty for a baguette, and what we say is, look. This is basically a bread share. If you want to join the bread share, you get a better deal. What do you get for a bread share? You get one loaf for five fifty. And you say, Well, wait a minute. I still it's still five fifty for a baguette. And I say, Yeah, but let's say you come, I make loaves that are five pounds. That's still a loaf. You get that for five fifty too. Depends on what you need. And so we've been trying to teach people, look, we're always here baking. You don't have to get the biggest thing every time. You if it's just you tonight, get a small thing. 
If it's your whole family, get a great big thing, and we'll just call it a loaf. You get it for your 550, and it all comes out in the wash. And what happens is people start breaking loose a little bit from the penny counting uh, aspect of the purchase, in part because they've paid in advance. So there's no cash transaction. It's just you walk up, you check your name that says you you're there, and then you take your bread. And it is true that over time people have gotten looser. So they just say, oh yeah, well they get today. That's great, you know. Next week I'll take a full niche. I'm like whatever. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's been interesting for us. Yeah, it is interesting. Okay, so does anybody want to take that very last question on how you work with plant breeders, if at all? We work with uh, Elizabeth, and we work with um, you know this ongoing uh, f uh, farm to bakery project. I think I think Elizabeth could probably speak about it better than I could. But we've you know done flour flour testing and, and bake testing uh, and uh, flavor testing here at the bakery. We you know invited bakers from all over to come and bake. And um, I don't know. Elizabeth calls me. She makes me jump. I jump. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's how it is. <laughs> no, I must no, say that, no. that, that um, there are a number of uh, initiatives in um, breeding for this kind of artisan baking, and um, the ones that I'm aware of, we're still working with the farmers to get something to um, that they think is going to be really good growing, but. Uh, of course, right along with that, we have to involve the bakers and the pasta makers, having them testing um, some of these new um, farmer bread varieties uh, to see, you know, to see how they're how they're working. So there's a lot. There are a lot of opportunities for for bakers and chefs and uh, um, pasta makers to get involved in ongoing um, breeding programs, and we'd we'd love to have you. Well, I think we're out of time, but I'd like to thank everyone for this great discussion and also to the audience members who submitted questions. So um, thank you so much, Elizabeth, Stefan, Peter, Dan, and Steve for um, sharing this information with us. And I'd like to encourage everyone to check out their websites. Um, and I'm getting very hungry now, um, looking at all these photos of delicious bread and pasta. So um, thanks to everyone for joining us.